So next up, <laughs> uh, we've got Michelle Kazban. She's a senior engineer on the Google Cloud Platform Developer Relations team. And she's going to tell us about Kubeflow, which is a Kubernetes framework for machine learning. Welcome, Michelle. All right. It's really great to be here. Thank you for the warm welcome. I'm here to talk to you about running machine learning applications on any Kubernetes environment uh, using Kubeflow. What is Kubeflow? It's a curated set of compatible tools and artifacts that lays a foundation for running production machine learning apps. That enables consistency across deployments by providing Kubernetes object templates that bring together disparate components. I just threw a lot of words at you. Not to worry, because I'll explain what Kubeflow has to do with paper airplanes. Before we dive in, a bit of background on who's standing in front of you. My name is Michelle Kasbon. I'm an engineer at Google. And I've been there for about nine months. And I've been working on the Kubeflow project the whole time. Well, prior to that, I was a director of data science at Cordoba, a startup based in San Francisco. And I was building machine learning applications on Google's Kubernetes engine. Prior to that, I was a data science engineer at another startup called Idibon where I was building machine learning applications on AWS. And the 10 years before that, I was a data engineer in the enterprise. So that gives you a sense of where I came from and why Kubeflow is important to me. But what I'll cover today, we'll talk about some of the main challenges in building machine learning applications and some of the goals that Kubeflow has in order to address those. We'll look at what's inside. We'll go through a really quick whirlwind demo. And then I'll briefly talk about the future direction. But before we talk too much about it, requisite disclaimer slide. Um, before you get started doing any machine learning, <laughs> I, it would be irresponsible if I didn't ask you to pose these two questions to yourself. Do you have a very clearly defined problem? And number two, can you solve it in a deterministic way? Because if you can do that, by all means, uh, don't use machine learning. Because if there's anything that my 10 years as a data engineer has taught me, it's that machine learning is not always the answer, despite what you may have heard on the internet. Uh, counting things is still really hard. So don't use machine learning until, unless you have to. All right, so let's talk about challenges. I want everyone to visualize their favorite piece of production code. Bring it up in your mind. You know the one I'm talking about. It's beautiful. It's sitting there. It's doing a very specific thing, and it's doing it well. How did that code get there? Where did it come from? It wasn't conceived in production. It didn't just show up one day. It came from probably a staging environment. How did it get into that staging environment? It was probably sitting in a development environment. And how did it get in there? At some point, there was a human sitting in front of a keyboard writing that code. If you've ever tried to move code from one environment to another, that road is fraught with peril. Forklifting things from one place to another, our friend, the, uh, the forklift driver, Klaus, he can tell you that you're at risk of death and destruction. No, I'm not going to play the clip, but if you want to search for it later, you can. Um, so moving code from one environment to another is tough. Because fundamentally, those environments are very different. There's a huge difference between running things on your laptop and running it in a data center. The next problem. Complexity. Remember that piece of production code that I had you visualize? If it was a machine learning application, it probably looked something like this. There's this perception of this, this outsized perception that the ML components are the biggest part when that doesn't usually reflect reality. It looks a lot more like this, right? There's a lot of pieces just to do anything with your data, just to generate features. You have all of these things. This is a small subset. Uh, you can build your models eventually, but then you have to do something with them. You want to version them. You want to be able to improve them, run them again, add new data to it. And that model sits somewhere. It goes inside an application. It serves a purpose. And that application lives on a platform. Supporting all of those things, non-trivial. Once you have all those pieces together, how do you maintain it? Are you able to discover when you have errors? Once you've found them, can you recover from them? And can you fix them to prevent them from happening again? And what does the speed of that process look like? Do you have a good CI-CD process in place for your machine learning applications? 
when you have a bug, can you revert back to a previous version, like Ben talked about? Is it that easy for machine learning? All right, those are some of the main challenges. How does Kubeflow address those? One of the main goals is to make it easy for everyone to develop, deploy, and manage portable, scalable ML everywhere. I promise you a paper airplane metaphor, so I'll tell you a story. My five-year-old son loves to build things out of paper. He'll be playing in the living room, and I'll go off to do something, maybe merge a PR or review something, and I'll come back, and the room is transformed. There's paper everywhere. So he'll throw blankets over all the furniture and pillows, and he'll build this giant fort, and he'll staple all these sheets of paper together, and he'll build bridges, and he'll connect everything to it. And there will be just dozens of paper airplanes on top of every surface. The room is full of them. It's beautiful. Now, those paper airplanes, they're just like your machine learning apps. Some of them have different purposes. He may want to hit someone in the face. <laughs> and when that's the case, accuracy is really important. But if he just wants to send you a message, it just has to get in your general area. There's different purposes for these pieces. But the one thing that they have in common is that you can move them from one physical environment to the other. Can you do that with your machine learning applications? Can you move all of them, the entire stack, over? Can you create a lot of them very quickly? He has scalability down pat. He can crank those things out like nothing else. And can you include everything you need for that application? So a lot of times he'll draw on those paper airplanes. He'll add parachutes and first aid kits, black boxes, anything. He'll put it all inside, and everything he needs is right there. Portable, scalable, and composable, just like Qtflow. And the idea is to be able to package up your machine learning app into uh, a single unit, nice gift-wrapped package. And we want to support the full product lifecycle, including access to any hardware, like GPUs or TPUs, because if you know what you're doing, that's how you can save costs and improve your model performance. Qflow is totally open. It's on GitHub. You can go check it out right now. Uh, it's for anyone involved in building a machine learning application. And we just had our 0 0.3 release. We have a quarterly release cadence. And it's Kubernetes native. You can run Kubeflow anywhere you have Kubernetes. Uh, that could be on GCP. That could be locally on Minikube. That could be anywhere you're running VMs. It uses open source Kubernetes APIs. And it provides custom resource definitions for distributing the training process. And those Kubernetes patterns are central to Kubeflow as well. This concept of building loosely coupled microservices and managing your infrastructure declaratively. And to do that, it uses an open source tool called Ksonnet, which is essentially a templating language for Kubernetes. And this is how we do that forklifting from one environment to the next. It has support for lots of different machine learning frameworks. There's TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, XGBoost, um, lots of different ones. Uh, let's take a look inside. So what exactly is Kubeflow again? It's a framework for running machine learning frameworks on the Kubernetes framework. You, you get the picture. Uh, so let's go back to our definition slide. It's, it's a set of compatible tools and artifacts that lays a foundation for running production ML apps. It enables consistency across deployments by providing Kubernetes object templates that bring together disparate components. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense now. So quick diagram. Um, a few of the components that are installed by default, there's more, but we'll just look at these today. Uh, you have a reverse HTTP proxy so that if all of your auth is handled, you have a single ingest point, and from there you can fan out to a central dashboard and all of your UIs, you can collect those in, in a single place. So that could be your Jupyter Hub, it be access to Jupyter Hub, uh, TensorBoard, TFJob dashboard, um, and then also a TFJob operator for taking those TensorFlow jobs and distributing them. So this is what a default install looks like. Okay, let's move into a quick demo. The idea behind this comes from one of my favorite NLP researchers, Dan Drafsky. Uh, if you, this is a very approachable book. If you're interested in linguistics at all, it's super interesting. He's done a lot of really sophisticated research around the language behind food. Um, our demo is not very sophisticated. It is a very straightforward two-point sentiment on Yelp restaurant reviews. 
So we take a review and we just determine whether it's positive or negative. So pretty simple. So we'll start out by installing Kubeflow. We'll do it locally first. We'll install these components and then we'll kick off training. We'll use something called Tensor to Tensor, which is a pre-configured, it's a library of pre-configured models. We'll pull that in, we'll run training locally, and then we'll move into the cloud. We'll run this on Kubernetes engine and we'll run the exact same files. We'll install Kubeflow and then kick off our training job against CPUs first. Uh, we're using that TF job operator, so we'll see a TF master, see a parameter server, and a couple of workers. We'll try that against TPUs and we'll see what the speed difference looks like. Once we have our trained model, we'll generate a serving component and then a UI that talks to that serving component, receives predictions, and displays it to the user. And from there, we'll go and we'll open up a notebook and we'll run that against GPUs. All right. So I prepared a recording because there's so much training involved. I realized that some people might be interested in watching neural nets converge, but I decided to spare the rest of us. So we'll start by looking at our very, uh, our, this is our UI, this is what we're trying to show. And we have a very simple naive function where we're just counting the number of negative words and assigning either a happy face if we think it's positive or a frowny face if not. So how does that work? Um, our review is the ramen was awful. It was bland and mushy, and after a few bites, I couldn't handle eating anymore. So pretty straightforward. Our naive approach, hard-coded, gives us pretty bad results. Machine learning can do better, so let's go in and install Kubeflow. We're starting locally. We have an empty instance of Minikube running, and what we're going to use is a tool called KFCTL. So we're initializing our local app, and what that does is it generates a directory. It sets environment variables for us. So we'll move into the directory, and then we'll generate our Kubernetes manifests. So well, this is just generating files locally. It hasn't done anything to our Minikube cluster yet, but it's pulling all those definitions down and creating them. Now we're applying it to our cluster. So this is where we take those manifests and we're actually creating the objects on Minikube. So it waits for the services to come up. And if we look to see what pods are running, we should see something similar to what we saw in our diagram. So we have our HTTP proxy. We have our central dashboard, Jupyter Hub. Spartacus is like anonymized metrics, uh, job dashboard, and TF job operator. So now we'll go into our case on it app directory, and we're going to copy in our training code. So this is just a file. It describes, um, it describes our TensorFlow code. It points to the right place and we're going to need some local parameters as well. So we're defining the code we want to run and how exactly we want it to run. So all we're doing is copying those into our directory. And now we can apply that component. So this is our tensor to tensor model against a CPU. And this is still local. This is still our mini cube cluster. So what does that look like? It's kicking off this job and we have, so there's a master, parameter server, and two workers now. So we take a look at the logs for that job. Oh, this is straight up TensorFlow code. It's, it's using tensor to tensor but it's just using regular TensorFlow libraries. So this should look familiar if you've ever used TensorFlow before. Um, it's pretty slow. We don't want to run this whole thing. So now is when we want to move into the cloud. So we're switching to a GKE cluster. Uh, we're connected to something running in the cloud. It's empty, there's nothing in it. And we have to do two things. We add our environment, so we tell our case on it app that we're connected to a new cluster. And now we can apply all of those components. So it's using that same code, those same Kubernetes manifests that were generated before. It's applying the exact same code to a new cluster. So anytime you run that apply command, it's applying it to your cluster, just like you would with kubectl. It's creating all the objects. And so we haven't actually changed any parameters. If you had differences, you could set that in your parameter file. But for now, it's just the same code, and that all looks familiar. Now it's time to run our training job. Again, this is the same co component that we ran locally, but now we have a whole cluster to run it on. It looks very similar. We'll check out the logs. 
to make sure that everything's running. Okay, this all looks good. Looks, looks the same, but still pretty slow, even though it's in the cloud. It's not great. We can do, we can do a little bit better. Well, let's try running against TPUs. This is pointing at the same TensorFlow code, but it's using TPUs instead. So if we look right here, so we have a new job. This is our uh, TPU master. So if we describe that pod, we see something interesting. We see this creating cloud TPUs for this pod. Um, the cool thing about this, this is one of my favorite things. When I created this GKE cluster, I used a beta feature called enable TPUs. And what that does, um, if, you, if you aren't familiar with a TPU, it's a, it's a tensor processing unit, and it's a hardware accelerator that's network attached. So you can attach it at job creation time, which is different from GPUs. So if you're using GPUs, they're attached to a physical node, and you're billed for the lifetime of that node. But with TPUs, because it's connected to the job, you're only billed for the lifetime of your training job. So billing is a bit different. Um, and let's see, it takes about three to four minutes for it to spin up. So we'll wait for that. All right, so this one took about four minutes. If we take a look at the logs, again, it's running the same code, but instead of running against a GPU or a CPU, um, you'll see it kicking off the TPU system. So it's just offloading some of that heavier processing onto this other piece of hardware. And so this global steps per second is significantly higher than it was against the CPUs. And so there's only one pod because it's using the hardware instead of having to fan it out um, as separate pods within Kubernetes. And the TF job operator knows how to handle that. All right, so now that we have our model trained, it's time to create our serving components and UI. So we'll copy those files over into our directory. Two of them, one for serving, one for UI. And then we can apply them. So adding these components is as simple as just applying. So now we have two new pods. We have serving and a UI. What we're doing now is we're port forwarding into that HTTP proxy. And that allows us to locally connect to the container on our cluster. So if we connect now, instead of hosting that local app, this is connected to the one running inside our cluster. So this is our naive version. We saw this one before. This calls that JavaScript function that just counts words. Not very accurate. Um, so now we'll move to that UI container that we just created. And what we're, what's happening here is that this UI container is talking to that serving container. So we can expect better results, more accurate results. All right, that looks much more usable. So what we want to do now, we used an off-the-shelf model. If we want to do something custom, uh, this is where we would go into JupyterHub, and we're going to choose a notebook image that supports GPUs. And we will spin up, uh, we'll spin up a pod. So this is running in the background. This is running on our cluster. We're accessing it locally, but it gives us a Jupyter environment to be able to run things. We can access those GPUs, and we can improve that model so that the next time we run training, we can have something that's a bit more accurate. So we're spinning up a notebook. Uh, it supports Python 2, Python 3. You can customize a lot of this, uh, but we're using just pretty stock. Um, one way of customizing is to pip install any packages that aren't in your base image. Uh, Kubeflow publishes images, but you could use your own as well in that selection. Uh, and yeah, you can run pretty much anything. Um, this code is on GitHub, so you can go and look at this uh, yourself. Uh, but we'll go, back to, we'll go back to our slides. All right, so it's all well and good watching me show you how to use Kubeflow, but if you want to try it yourself, uh, codelabs.developers.google.com. There are a few good self-guided walkthroughs that you can take a look at. 
Um, also Quick Labs, if you want a code for that, um, I have some codes that I can distribute. Just contact me, just DM me on Twitter. I can send you that. Catacode is another option. Um, there are, there's a bunch of markdown in the GitHub examples repo. You can run through those on your own as well. And then we publicly host a demo at gh-demo, which is uh, the UI for some of the walkthroughs in the repo. Uh, so this project was started at Google. It was founded at Google, but there are a lot of other companies involved. Um, this slide is a little bit out of date. There's, there's a lot more. Um, thank you to everyone. I know there's at least one contributor in the audience, uh, but thank you to everyone who's helped support this project. If you're interested in getting involved, um, we'd love to have you. It's, it's not just open source, it's open contributions. A lot of it is driven by the community. Um, so please join the Slack channel or join our community meetings. Uh, we're a pretty welcome bunch. Uh, we had our first contributor summit where we all got to meet face to face. That was about a month ago. Um, and what we have planned for the future, uh, I mentioned we have month or quarterly release cycles. So 0.4, we'll get that out before the end of the year. Um, some of the things coming out in that, uh, one of our community members, Josh, he's putting all this together. And it's, I believe it's all open. You can see all of the GitHub issues that are part of this release. Um, one of the things I'm most excited about is the click to deploy process. So I did pretty much all of that in the terminal, but there's a really nice UI coming out that lets you spin up a new project in, on GCP and sort of create all the infrastructure that you need uh, to get this started. So there's, there's a lot coming. Um, and if you want to help influence this, uh, file issues, file bugs, they're always more than, uh, you're always more than welcome to, uh, to include your input. So uh, that's all I had. If there are any questions, I think we have some time. So I had a couple questions. Uh, first, um, when you're working in Google Cloud, obviously resources tend not to be a concern. They're largely infinite for most users. Uh, if you're on-prem running your own Kubernetes cluster, resources tend to be finite. Um, traditional HPC schedulers such as Slurm handle that, you know, pretty well. That's what they're designed for. Mm -hmm. Are there similar mechanisms within Kubeflow or Kubernetes in general that you're developing to handle some of those where maybe you want to schedule a job, the resources aren't yet available, but they'll become available when a job finishes? Mm, that's an interesting question. I, I don't think we've addressed the resource scheduling. I, I think... I think the idea of Kubeflow is to leave a lot of that to the underlying Kubernetes infrastructure. So if it's a Kubernetes feature, it's there. Um, uh, so someone in the audience is saying that Kubernetes has that capability. I, I would say we're, we're trying to really focus on the ML component. So I think that's probably outside the bounds of what the project is achieving. And so I guess the second question is, um, pardon me if I pronounce it wrong, Katib, sort of the, the Vizier derivative. Um, mm -hmm. What's the status of that? And sort of when do you expect that to become you know, stable, ready for uh, use at a sort of a large scale? Yeah, so it was actually part of the 0.3 release. Um, so you can, you can use it today. Um, I didn't show it here because it's really big and it's hard to show that on, on Minikube, but you can actually go onto GitHub and, and download it. Um, I haven't really played around with it, uh, and I'm sure that I do know that there are some modifications we want. Uh, we want to do something about using a Mongo backend being problematic, um, so there are some discussions around changing a few things, but as far as I know, it's, it's operational today. Thank you.